Well, good morning again. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, begin turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We are finishing up the book of 1 Corinthians, and this summer we're going to be doing something a little bit different for June and July. What we're going to be doing in June and July is each week um, <clears throat> we will take an one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. We're going to overview that minor prophet, kind of tell you who they are, what they're kind of doing, what they were doing, and how, what that reveals about who God is in that minor prophet, what characters of God that were being revealed, and how it fits in the gospel story, and how it points us to Christ. And so we're going to, I know sometimes you can be reading through the Old Testament, and you get some of those books, and you're kind of like, I don't know what to do with this information. Um, It sounds like there's a lot of Problems. I don't understand all the problems, but it seems like there's a lot of problems, there's a lot of fighting, and a lot of nations destroying each other and calling for the wrath of God. I don't get it. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to take some of the minor prophets this summer, and we're going to kind of overview those, help us kind of understand where they fit in the story and what they reveal about God, what it reveals about his character, and how it fits in and points us to the gospel. So that's kind of what we'll be doing. And so next week we'll be starting with the book of Hosea. And so then you can have an idea of what we're doing this summer. But today as we're finishing out the letter to the church of Corinth, the first letter that we have written to them, Paul's kind of ending with some kind of basic, some things that we should be doing. So today what we're going to be doing is we're talking about focus. We're going to be talking about focus that glorifies God. Because, you know, we can be focused on a lot of things that aren't good. And we can be focused on a lot of things that are good and beneficial when it comes to trying to live a life for the glory of God. So we're going to talk about different levels of focus and things like that and how important that is. So thinking about that, have y'all ever struggled before with staying focused on things? I mean, be honest. How many of y'all, like me, have a lot of projects that you've started around the house that are about anywhere from 10 to 80% done? All over, yeah, Craig's got both hands up, right? Yeah, and so we all have those moments, right? Or maybe you're, how many of y'all have been reading a book and then all you're like, wow, I have no idea what the last two pages was about. Anybody else got that for me and all that good stuff? Yeah, focus can be really hard sometimes. It can be very difficult. Did y'all see that over there? I'm just kidding. See, focus, we can lose focus really quick if we're not careful. And that's, I feel like that's sometimes how we go through life as believers. God has given us some things like, hey, I want you to focus on these things. And then all of a sudden we see something shiny over here in the world, or we see something over here. And we, all of a sudden what God told us to focus on, we're quickly drawn to something else. And that seems to happen to us a lot. And I think if we pay attention, we see a lot of our life is just our focus being pulled here and there, all different directions all the time. And we live a lot of our life incomplete because we don't follow through all the way because we do leave, lose focus a little bit. I think that's what happens to believers, unfortunately, a lot. We get saved, we start reading the Bible, and we start, we're, we're excited, and we're all doing those things. And then we kind of go along. And just kind of the burdens of life and the things of the world kind of slowly distract us. And then all of a sudden you see believers. Well, I've been a believer for 20 years, but I really don't read my Bible. Well, like, well, how? Why? Because over time you got distracted. See, if you just read a chapter a day from the book, from the Bible, and you just read a chapter a day, over the course of 20, 30 years, you're going to read through the Bible multiple, multiple times. The problem is not your ability to read or comprehend or your time. The problem is focus. Being focused on what truly matters. And so we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 16, verses 15 through 24, and we're going to kind of talk about this idea of being focused on the right things. Beginning in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15, it says, Brothers and sisters, you know the household of Stephanus. They are the first fruits of Acadia and have devoted themselves to serving the saints. I urge you also to submit to such people and to everyone who works and labors with them. I am delighted to have Stephanus for, for Tutidus and Acacius present because these men have made up for your absence, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, recognize such people. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla send you greetings warmly in the Lord along with the church that meets in their home. All the brothers and sisters send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. This greeting is my own hand, Paul. 
If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him, our Lord come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with all of you in Christ Jesus. So starting off here with verses 15 through 18, I want us to see this idea of being focused as believers refreshing one another. Here he kind of lists these people and Yes, I pronounced all their names correctly. Don't go to your Bible app and hit play and listen to how they pronounce it. Just assume how I pronounced the names was correct. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. But here he's mentioning these people and how they refreshed their soul and how, you know, it, it, they, were like, they were refreshing and they were all these wonderful things. And why were they so fre- refreshing? Because we see in ver- into verse 15, they have devoted themselves to serving the saints. As believers, okay, you focus on, okay, this idea, we're going to start, we're going to look at small, and then we're going to slowly get bigger with our focus. When you kind of pinpoint down to, okay, who am I, and who am I to be? And you start there at the very focus, you just narrow that focus, it's very pointed, who am I, and who am I supposed to be? You have to come come to that through the lens of who Christ is. And who God has called you to be. He's called you to be his follower. To be his worshiper. And he's called you to serve other people. To love other people. See the world, when they start, the world, what it does is when it narrows down that focus and says, okay, who are you and what are you supposed to do and and who who are you supposed to be? The world is going to tell you all the time, look at yourself first. Find yourself What do you want? Who do you want to be? And the world is this very self-centered look at who you are. But we're actually supposed to look, when we look internally, okay, who am I? Who am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to do? We look unto Christ. We don't look to self. And see here, when he's saying here, it's like, okay, you need to be devoted to serving the saints. The question becomes then, okay, are you a refresher or are you a drainer? What I mean by that is like when people spend time with you, when people are around you, do they feel refreshed in their soul and their spirit or do they feel drained? And a lot of that has to do with that that approach and that narrowing down of like, okay, who am I? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? That's going to impact how other people experience you. Because if you're about self and you're looking internally, you are going to quickly become a drainer. You're going to become one of those, when people are around you, they're like, that was exhausting. But if you're looking at Christ, and you're looking to Christ to determine who you are, and who you're called to be, and you look at, hey, I'm a servant of Christ, and I'm a servant of others. When people come around you, they're going to feel refreshed, and they're going to feel built up. We've all had those experiences, right? Right? You see someone come in, you're like, oh. And then you've had those people come in, like, oh, yay. Right? You, I remember, like, working at one, one of the golf courses I worked at in, in college. You know, you'd look at the shift, and you're like, oh, no. Who am I closing with? Because closing, you know, there was a lot of cleanup happening, things like that. And you'd look at the list, and you'd be like, oh, I'm doing 90% of the work. And then you're going to be like, ah, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be a great night. This is going to be great. This is going to be fun. We're going to get things done. It's going to be happy. We, we see those type of things. And we, I don't think we often think about, though, which person are we? Because we're really focused on which person other people are. We're really good at that. We're really good at saying, like, oh, they're, they're good. They're not good. Oh, they're a refresher. They're a drainer. Okay. We're really good at picking other people apart. But we rarely look at ourselves, which one am I? Am I a refresher of souls or am I a drainer? Well, how do you know how to be a refresher of souls? What does that look like? Well, we're given a lot throughout Scripture, but one of the just basic, simple, most common Scriptures you can ever turn to is the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5. I want you to think about, it. If, you, if you ran across this type of person, think about, okay, whether they'd be refreshing or whether they'd be draining. Someone who is loving Joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, gentle, 
faithful, self-controlled. And they, oh, that person is going to be a refresher. So that's who we're called to be in Christ. Is we're to bear fruit, and that fruit specifically, the fruit of the Spirit. If we're, if we're coming and we're looking, okay, who am I? Who am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be doing? If we come to Christ for those answers and we submit ourselves to Christ and we start living for the glory of God and we start producing the fruit of the Spirit, we naturally become refreshers. See, drainers are those in Galatians it talks about that are carrying out the works of the flesh, not carrying out the fruit of the Spirit. The works of the flesh, as listed in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, says the sexually immoral, the moral impure, the, promis- the prom- promiscuous, the idolaters, sorcerers, pe- hatred, people who hate, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. Other scriptures list on there like gossip, slander, stealing, laziness, lukewarmness. All those type things, all those characteristics are characteristics of those who are going to drain others. But see, a lot of times we tend to take some of these things in our life and we tend to justify them away because we look through them as selfish lens. I'm not hurting anyone else, so it's okay for me to do this. But in reality is we don't sin in isolation. Our sins impact the people around us. They just always do. Parents, everything you do is going to impact your children and the people in your home. You can't escape it. You can't pretend it doesn't happen. It doesn't matter. It's going to impact. How you are living out your faith is going to impact the church. It's just going to. Um, I know we joke about color of carpet splitting churches, but that's real. Um, there was a church um, a couple weeks ago. They're about to split. In the, they're a Southern Baptist church. They're about to split over color of carpet in their sanctuary. They're getting new carpet, and there was a problem with the color, and they're about to split. That's real. Well, how does it get there? It's because... The sins of the individual people impact the church as a whole. That's why we read earlier in 1 Corinthians, when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. So we don't sin in isolation. So you look at these things that are listed here, the works of the flesh, and when you allow those things to sit in your life and you're not repenting of those things, you're not trying to move past those things, you're not battling those things, but you've accepted those things as part of your life, you're going to become a drainer. You're going to be someone who, who drains other people. Very specifically, you're going to be draining those who are in the faith. So I want us to think about for just a moment, how do people walk away from time spent with us? So ask yourself, okay, how do, how do people feel after time spent with me, how do people walk away feeling? Again, we're really good at examining how we feel when, when we walk away from people. But do we take the time to think about, okay, when they walked away from time spent with me, were they refreshed? Were they drained? Or was there, was there no change? Or was it indifferent? Was it nothing? Does your time spent with other people, does it have like an eternal impact Or does that time vanish into the background of life with no impact? See, we need to be intentional about refreshing other people and being refreshers. Which means, as it says there in the end of verse 15, we need to be devoting ourselves to serving the saints. See, refreshers are servants. It goes back to the two great commands, right? The first command is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And again, we talked about what love was in 1 Corinthians 13, that love is an action, right? Love is something you do. So in order for us to be refreshers, we have to be intentional about serving other people. Which means we don't show up places to be served, 
And I know that kind of goes contrary to a lot of things you're like, because you may think like, yeah, yeah, but what about at a restaurant? No, no, we understand as believers, when we show up at a restaurant, we're not there to be served by the waiters and waitresses and the cooks. We're there on behalf of Christ, looking for an opportunity to serve them for the glory of God. We have a servant mentality everywhere we go. You show up to the tire place to get new tires. They're not there to serve you. You're there to look for an opportunity to serve them well, to encourage them, to build them up. So refreshers are people who see themselves as committed servants. Now, why do we need to see ourselves as committed servants everywhere we go? From the tire place to the restaurant to when we show up at church, we're always to be thinking, I need to be serving others. Is because we are commanded to have that attitude. Because that was the attitude of Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8, it says, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Adopt, it says, make it your own. Own it, secure it, settle it, make it just whatever attitude Christ had, that's the attitude I'm going to have towards people. And continuing on in verse 6 of Philippians 2, it says, Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. If the King of kings and the Lord of lords can step into humanity and think of himself as a servant, you and I have no excuse to think of ourselves in any other way. Are we greater than Christ? Are you more worthy than Christ? Which means what we're doing is we're going to see ourselves as a servant. So when you think of that focus, okay, who am I? Who am I called to be? You look to Christ. Who are you called in Christ? You're called to be a follower of God, to worship him, to love him, to be a servant of others. Because that's who Christ was, a servant of others. And so at the very micro level, when you think about who am I, you need to think of yourself as a servant. Paul often used that term bond slave. If you notice in the letters to the letter of the Galatia and Ephesus and different things, he said Paul, a bond servant of Christ. That word bond servant, or some of your translations say may bond slave or different things, that particular word was used in that day as someone who willingly made themselves a slave of somebody else. So slavery back then was a little bit different than what we think of what it was in America back in the day. There is, a lot, a lot of times it was like endangered service, for servanthood, basically. You were working off debt. You became someone's slave for a period of time and for a period of, it, to work off certain things. Now there was obviously people just taking people and owning them as well. But in this time in, in Israel and things like that, this is more what was happening. As people became slaves of others to pay off debt. But see, if the slave there, when their debt was paid off, loved their master so much that they want to dedicate the rest of their life to them, what they would do is they would go out to the city gate and they would take a, a piece of metal and they would, a nail of some sort, and they would nail their ear to a post out front in front of the gate so that everyone knew that they loved their master so much that they were voluntarily giving up their freedom to become a lifelong slave of their master. And that's who we're called to be. We're called to be bondservants of Christ. We're called to be lifelong slaves of Christ. Meaning he's the master. What he says goes. What he wants is what we want. What he loves is what we love. What he despises is what we despise. So when you think about your life, and you're thinking about, okay, who am I? Who am I called to be? What do I need to be doing? You look unto Christ and you be, think of yourself as a servant. First and foremost, a servant of the Most High. And secondly, as a servant of others. If you come to that moment and you think of self, well, what do I want? What do I need? You're going to find yourself deviating from God's word and God's plan for your life very quickly. Because this life is not about you. It is about Him. It's about glorifying God, not self. And so we see here that believers need to be f refreshing one another. So we need to be focused on being servants. And then we move to a bigger picture. 
In verses 19 through 20, he kind of transitions here just a little bit. And he starts saying, the churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla send you greetings warmly in the Lord along with the church that meets in their home. <clears throat> All the brothers and sisters send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. So we have like this focus individually. Okay, individually, I need to look at my life through the lens of who Christ has called me to be, who he is. I need to adopt the same attitude as Christ. And then we get to the little bit bigger picture. See, a little bit bigger picture, what the world wants you to see is the, a little bit bigger picture of your life is building things here in this world. Build a career. Build a retirement. Build a legacy. Build it. These are the things you need to be going after. These things that you need. You need more of this. You need more of that. And we get very quickly, if we're not careful, we can start building the things that the world wants us to build in contrary to what God has called us to do. Now, yes, we are to be good stewards of whatever God has given us and wherever we're at. So if you have a job, you work hard. If you have money, you be a good steward of that money. If you have an opportunity to build a retirement, be wise. Scripture talks about them in Proverbs, being wise with those things. But the difference is, is we understand all of these things of the world are just opportunities to be leveraged for the glory of God, for the big picture of God building his kingdom here through the church. See, our big picture should be seen through the lens of the church. Are we seeking to build up not just our individual church, but the churches of God? See, you have a mission. When you say, okay, I'm giving my life to Christ, I'm going to follow after Christ, I'm going to be a servant of Christ, what you end up doing is you become a servant of the church in building the kingdom of God. And building other churches. Because that's how God has decided to work in and through the world. Is through the church. And the church is not a building. It is a people. God has chosen to build his kingdom through people. And that's very important. Because that is not what the world is going to call you to build. The world is having you focused on stuff. Whereas Christ is having you focused on people. Big difference. And so when we think about this, as a church, are we an encourager to the kingdom at large, or are we a discourager? See, we don't compete with other churches. We work together for the same goal. Now, in Scripture, what we do is we do see where we are to support doctrinally sound churches. Churches that are not doctrinally sound, are, we are to call them to repentance. Paul does this. John does this. Jesus does this. Peter does this. All throughout Scripture. We encourage faithful churches. We point out unfaithful churches. And this is the pattern we see all throughout Scripture. We encourage the good. We correct the bad. Now, the issue is, is that we are really good at pointing out the bad. And we are really good at calling those out. Well, look at that church over there. Look at their bad teachings, their bad doctrine. We're really good at those things. What we're not naturally good at is encouraging good. That's because of our sin nature. It doesn't come quite as naturally to encourage the good. What comes a little bit naturally is to condemn the bad. And we need a balance there. So on our High on the Hog ministry, what we did is we set up that booth down there at High on the Hog, and we were sharing the gospel with people. If someone got saved and they lived in Estill Springs, what we would do is we'd go, hey, there's a church right around the corner from your home. Here's the church. David's a the pastor there. Go meet with that church. Get involved in that church. Oh, you guys said you lived up on the you live up on the mountain, Keith Springs. Awesome. There's a church up there. Ron's the pastor. You need to get connected with Ron. It's right there in your community. Why? Because we're not concerned necessarily with just building our own little empire here. We're concerned about the bigger picture. And see, that's where churches can get in trouble as a collective. We get so focused on our little tiny tribe that we lose sight of the bigger picture. 
And so what we need to do as a church is we need to be more concerned about building the kingdom as a whole rather than just building our own little kingdom here. Now, again, we are to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with, which means we need to upkeep our property. If we're going to have property, we need to upkeep it. We need to make sure it's taken care of. We need to make sure it's fixed. All those type things because we want to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with. But at the same time, remembering this isn't all there is that God has for us. We need to be partnering with other churches. We need to be going on mission trips. We need to be sharing the gospel. We need to be building other churches along the way as well. Now, God has opened up a couple doors for us to do some things like that. One of the doors that God is opening up, we were approached, which we're going to talk about this on June 9th at our business meeting a little bit more, but we were approached and asked if we would help sponsor a, or provide a space for a Hispanic Bible study on Sunday nights. Out of, there's a church, there's a Hispanic church that meets at Grace Baptist in Tullahoma, and they've started in Tullahoma, they're growing, they're looking at moving and starting reaching Hispanics here in Franklin County, and they need kind of a home base to do that out of, and they ask, hey, could we use a space, and uh, maybe use a room in your church on Sunday nights, where we can start a Hispanic Bible study and start reaching the Hispanics in this area with the gospel. Now, it's really easy to say, but this is ours. We don't want anything messed up. Or we can say, hey, you know what? We see a bigger picture of the kingdom. And we're going to build and strengthen other churches as well. So as a church, we need to have a kingdom mindset. Where we're thinking just, not just about our individual church, but we're thinking about the churches around us as well. That may need help. That may need encouragement. And so we need to be intentionally encouraging other churches and building them up as well. Which means we need to be open to strugg- helping struggling churches in our area. It might look like at some point, maybe we might need to send a few families over to a church that's struggling to help them rebuild. Sometimes it might mean starting new churches, like a Hispanic, helping start a Hispanic church, or maybe planting another church in another area. But we can't just be so self-focused as a church that we lose sight of the bigger picture. Which means you can't be so, self, so self-consumed, focused on yourself and your personal life, that you bring that into the church. Which means you're looking at your life and everything you have. Okay, this is what God has given me. This is, this is the resources I have. How can I leverage that to build the church? Not just my church, but churches. Which is why I love that we're part of the Southern Baptist Convention. We support over 3,000 full-time missionaries all across the world. Through the monies that we give, we support church plants all across North America through the North American Mission Board. Disaster relief. Think about what the disaster relief does. We're the, we're the number one, the Southern Baptist Convention has the number one volunteer disaster relief force in the United States. A lot of people don't realize because we we're not very good at marketing and it's not about getting the fame or getting the recognition. But when there's a natural disaster in the continental 48 states and the Red Cross is called in, the first call they make is to NAM and say, hey, we need your people. Because we can feed people and we can clean out things like nobody else can. But that takes a bigger picture outside of ourselves. Which means if we don't have the bigger picture individually, we're not going to have it collectively either. So individually you need to look at, okay, how can I use all that I have that God has blessed me with, what he has given me, how can I be a good steward of it and leverage that for the glory of God through giving, through serving, through supporting We need to have a bigger picture. And the bigger picture is the church, is the kingdom of God. And I know it's Memorial Day weekend, and we celebrate those, and I am so thankful for those who have have come before us, who have served in the military, and those who are currently serving. I have a lot of family who have faithfully served in the military, and that is wonderful, and it is great. But my priority can't be building America. It has to be building the church first. Church has to come first. That means me building a personal legacy has to be tied to the church and the kingdom of God. What good is it if I leave my kids all these things, all these material things, but I don't leave them a love for the church and for the kingdom of God? 
It'll all be meaningless. Because these things come and go. The material things of this world, they're going to come and they're going to pass and they're going to go away. So there's a bigger picture. And that is the church. And then he closes up verse 21 through 24. This greeting is my own hand, Paul. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with all of you in Christ Jesus. So there is a small picture that we talked about how we need to be focused on who we are in Christ and who we're called to be in Christ and as to be servants. And there's that bigger picture where it, we're to be building the church and, and seeking to encourage the church at large. But then there's an eternal picture that the world does not have. And there's not a comparison there. And I know we don't always like to talk like this, but it's a reality. If anyone does not love the Lord, curse be on him. That, that word there, that wording there in the Greek is this idea of being cursed Doomed to damnation. There's a reality for those who are not in Christ. And that reality is an experience, an eternal experience of the wrath of God. See, the world lives as if there is no eternity. Therefore, there's no consequences to what we do long term. But as believers, we understand that that's not true. We understand that at one day, everyone will stand before God himself. And we understand everyone will be divided into two groups. Those in Christ, those outside of Christ. What the world doesn't understand is that outside of Christ, they are so desperately hopeless. They are desperately hopeless, and they are clueless to that hopelessness. But we know. We know that there is this eternal picture, there's this eternity that is waiting for us that we will experience. Now, Sean Penn, he's a atheist magician, fairly popular. You've probably heard of him or seen his stuff before. If you can't picture him, if you Googled him, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that guy. But he's an atheist. He's a magician. He does magic, all that kind of stuff. He goes around and does that around the country. And he was telling this story one time, which you can find this on YouTube if you Google it. He, he ran into this guy who was a Christian, and he was doing street magic, and this Christian came up to him, and he's like, look, I just want to share something with you. And he shared the gospel with him. And Sean's takeaway was like, you know, I don't believe any of that, anything like that. But he was reflecting on one of his YouTube channels and kind of like that. He was talking. He's like, I started thinking about what this guy did to me. He loved me enough to tell me about something, some destruction that was coming my way. And he said, it got me thinking. If Christians truly believe that Jesus is the only way, and without Jesus, there is an eternity of hell waiting you, he said, how much does a Christian have to hate someone to not tell them? Because sometimes we get so focused and distracted by the things of the world that we forget there's an eternity coming. And that those without Christ are cursed to eternal damnation. And we have been called to be light and salt to that world. We are commanded, like I mentioned earlier in the baptism, go and make disciples. That was a command from Christ. Every believer, not just pastors, every believer is commanded to go and make disciples. Which means if you're not going to share the gospel with people, if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to make disciples, if you're not willing to be light and salt, 
What you're saying without saying it is, God, I don't care what you want for my life. I'm doing my own thing, and I don't care if people, my friends, my family, my neighbors, I don't care if they're cast into the lake of fire. I don't care if that's their reality, because what I care about is me and what I want in the moment. I don't want to feel uncomfortable. I don't want to be the weird kid. I don't want to be the one that everybody's like, oh, there's that guy again talking about all this Jesus stuff. I want to fit in so much so that I'm willing to watch them be cast in the lake of fire for all eternity. See, as believers, there's nothing that can separate us from the love that we have in Christ Jesus. Paul said that with very much confidence through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced that neither height nor depth the things created, things on heaven, things on earth, under the earth, nothing can separate us from the love that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. But what the enemy can do is distract us. That's the only play the enemy has against believers. The enemy cannot change our eternal standing before a holy God. So his only thing he can do is distract you. And if you look at our culture, the world is complete. Everything is designed to distract us from who God has called us to be as a people. And we fall for it generation after generation after generation. And we know how much we have fallen for it every four years. Every four years in the United States when an election comes along, there is a passion in people in the church for who's going to be president that if they had that for making disciples, the things that you know about these candidates and the things that you know about all these things that's happening in the world, if you had that kind of knowledge about Scripture, Think about the impact, the light and salt we could be if we were just as passionate about Christ as we were about the things of the world. But we've been distracted in thinking that America matters more than what's happening in the church. We've been distracted to think my, my job and my retirement is more important than serving in the life of the church. We've been distracted to think, well, I come to church to get something I come to church rather than coming to church to be served, and we get distracted. There's all these distractions to pull us away from who God has called us to be as a people because that's the only play of the enemy. And so we know that. We know that the enemy is going to be trying to distract us. And the thing is, is we know how to deal with that distraction. Fix your eyes on Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was laid before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There is a reality and there is a false reality. And they are constantly battling in our lives. Reality is that we're all going to stand before God one day. We're all going to be going to give an account. Reality, God has called us to be servants. Reality, God has called us to love him. Reality, God has called us to be light and salt. He's called us to pursue people, to share the gospel, to stand out and, and go after people as much as we possibly can. The false reality is that the things in this world matter more. And I've seen it in, in 18 years of student ministry. I saw it over and over and over and over again. Parents were more concerned about their kids going to college and getting a good job, living in a nice neighborhood, having the cars, having all these things, than they were concerned about their spiritual well-being. 
I saw it for decades, sitting there, parents concerned, like, I'm going to put my kid in every travel ball they can because they're going pro. No, they're not. Seeing your kid play. But I've seen it all throughout the years, parents sacrificing church every chance they get. But see, it's not just the parents because those parents learned it from the other people in the church. Hey, it's a beautiful weekend. Eh, let's go to the lake instead. Ooh, it's raining. I don't really get out. Let's stay home. Do you know now it's gotten, church attendance has gotten such a way that can, to be considered an active participant in the life of the church means that you attend once a month. They've had to move that out because if they said, well, active attendance involves you need to be there at least three times a month, our numbers would like shrink a lot. There's not a dedication to the church because we've convinced ourselves that the dedication we have to the world is more important. I mean, think about it for just a moment. Me as a pastor, if I miss church 15 times a year, would y'all be good with that? The standard for me being here is no different than the standard for you being here. If you're not committed, why in the world would you expect your pastor to be committed to? That's called being a hypocrite. See, the reality of it is, is we're easily distracted from what really matters. And so as Paul is closing out this letter to the church of Corinth, he's reminding them, look, celebrate and look at these people who devoted themselves as servants of others. The churches are, think about the churches, all the work that God is doing all around the world. And he says, remember, those outside of Christ are cursed. But see, those of us who are in Christ have the grace of the Lord Jesus. And the grace of God should be a massive motivator in our life. Because if we truly understand and we embrace the grace of God and we, we look through life through that lens... We begin to understand, okay, I didn't earn salvation, which means salvation is available for any type of person, so I can share with anyone. We understand that salvation is a free gift. We understand that Jesus is the only way of salvation. We understand that someone shared the gospel with us, so therefore we need to share the gospel with someone else so that they can hear as well. We understand that without hearing the gospel, people will die and go to hell. We understand that without the gospel, people will never know the grace, the mercy, and love of God as we do. So the question is, is where is your focus? Where is our focus? And where should it be? The whole book of Ecclesiastes is written about this. All of life is like a vapor. All is vanity. Here and gone. That hit a little bit closer to home this year. Remember a little tiny Daniel when he was little. I was there when he was born. And now he's graduated high school. He's going to go off to college. He's moving out. Austin's already got big plans for his, room, his section of the room. I'm like, oh, we're going to take that, Dad. We're going to remodel that. I'm like, where's Daniel going to sleep when he comes back? I don't care. We're going to take his space, right? And so the, you, you see like how life just moves on quickly, doesn't it? It just keeps moving and keeps moving and keeps moving. And if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves decades down the road having focused on the wrong things and then wonder where did it all go wrong? What happened? That's a lot of counseling that pastors end up doing with people. I don't know how I got here. And it's really hard as a pastor not to be like, it's easy. You loved the world more than you loved God. But you can't really say that to people because they kind of get offended at that. He's like, you don't know that. I love God. I'm like, well, you're sporadic in church. You're sporadic in your Bible study you mentioned. You don't really give. You don't really serve. 
Yeah, pretty much you love the world more than you love God. You look at the excitement that Christians have at election season and in the fall when football season kicks off. If somehow we could convince believers that God is more important and greater and more glorious than those things, Winchester would not be the same. As a whole, we've lost focus. But that starts individually. You need to ask yourself, okay, who am I, who am I called to be? Then you take a step back, okay, God's building his kingdom through the church, through his people. How do I get involved in that? How can I be a part of that? Because God wants you a part of that. God's commanded you to be a part of that. You don't have an option. You're supposed to be involved in that. And then you remember the bigger picture of all, that we are heading, we are quickly, as fast as we possibly can, we are screaming towards eternity. Where we'll all stand before God. And it won't matter the job you had, or the legacy you built, or the inheritance you left to your kids. All that will matter is what did you do with the gospel? What did you do with Jesus? And did you serve him? So if you're here today and you're like, you know what? I have not been living my life for the purpose it needs to be living. I've been living for self. And I don't know of this God that you speak of. See, in the beginning, God created everything. And he created everything to display his glory and his majesty, to show his love and his grace and his mercy. But then sin entered into the world. Man took what God had created that was good and, and, and perfect, and man sinned and corrupted it. Now we live in a broken, fallen world. And we've all sinned, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, every one of us. There's none of us who are perfect. There's none of us who are rat- righteous. None of us have arrived. But see, God is still holy, and he is still perfect. And there's a consequence for that sin that we commit against God. The wages of sin is death. Eternal damnation, meaning that all you experience for all eternity is the wrath of God being poured out upon you. But, one of the greatest conjunctions in all of Scripture, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, Jesus, God himself, stepped out of heaven and came to earth. He lived a perfect life that we couldn't live. As fully God, as fully man, mystery, but God himself came and lived this perfect life for us. And then he walked to the cross on our behalf. And he died on the cross and he was buried. And on the third day he rose from the dead so that we might have life. So we might have the gospel. Gospel just means good news of Jesus. The good news of Jesus is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, that we may become the righteousness of God. See, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our hearts, God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. There is hope in Jesus, but Jesus alone, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. So if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ and you've never followed after Jesus and you're kind of like, but you you don't know what I've done, you don't know where I've been, you don't know what I've experienced, you don't know what I've said, there is not a sin that there is not enough sin for you to out the grace of God. If that were the case, all of us would be hopeless. But in Christ, there is hope for you. And we, want, we would love to talk to you about that further, how you can give your life to Christ, how you can follow after him. 
And if you're a believer here this morning, the gospel, that good news of Jesus, should be everything to you. It should be what you hold dearest in your heart and in your mind. That should be the most precious thing to you is the good news of Jesus. So much so that you can't help but to tell other people. Just like we're getting to that, we're going to get into this fall. And those Alabama fans are going to be all happy to tell you about how Alabama is going to be fine without Saban. We're not going to hear the end of it. They're going to get out there and they're going to tell you. And then you're going to have the Tennessee fans. Again, this is our year. I think it is. We're going to go undefeated and win everything. But still, there's an excitement to tell people about the things you're excited about. If you're having trouble sharing the gospel with other people, it might be that you're just not excited about it anymore because you've lost focus. Because you're certainly going to be excited to tell me about those Vols or about the Crimson Tide or about the Eagle War Tiger people in Auburn that can't make up their minds. You, you tell the things that you're excited about. You prioritize the things that you love and treasure the most. So take a step back and look at What am I treasuring? What am I valuing? What am I excited about? And does that match who I'm supposed to be in Christ? And if it doesn't, great news. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. His mercies are new and fresh every day, which means that you can start fresh today. So that I haven't been focused on the right things. Great. Be focused now and get to work. Think about today and what you need to do today. Be in God's word. Pray, love people, serve people. Look for opportunities to build people up, to be refreshers. You can start fresh. You don't have to wait to get your life together. You don't have to wait until all the stars align. You don't have to wait for any of that. You can start today without excuse because Christ is able. There is good news in this word. There's a lot to be excited about. There's a lot of things that we can look to, we can cling to, hold on to. Don't be distracted by the trivial things of this world. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Run the race that has been set before you. Walk by faith and not by sight. Let us pray. Father, we want to come to you this morning. We want to praise you and thank you for the gospel. That not only can we be forgiven of our sins, but we can be cleansed and all your righteousness placed upon our account so that one day we can stand before the throne with confidence. Understanding that confidence is not in ourselves and our abilities or anything like that. But we know that Christ, that you will be standing there on our behalf. May the joy of that and the excitement of that just overflow and overwhelm us. You have called us to be light and salt, to take that good news of your mercy and of your grace and your love and spread it to all people. So Father, help us to be that light and salt you've called us to be. Help us to be a people who fix our eyes upon Jesus and we look to you in order to determine who we are and who we're called to be. That you'd help us to see that there's a bigger picture, that you're building your kingdom, and we need to be a part of that. And help us to also remember there is an eternity that we're all going to face. And that there are people who have no clue what is about to happen. Give us an urgency to share the gospel. Father, help us just to love you more today than we ever have. Help us to be more focused on the things we need to be focused on than more than we ever have. Help us to band together, to encourage each other, to lift each other up as we try to walk through and navigate this life in this broken world.
Lord, if there's anyone here today who's never given their life to you, Lord, we pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. Spirit, we ask that you would bring conviction upon them that they can do nothing else other than to cry out to Jesus. Lord, you are good in more ways than we can even begin to describe or to number. You are worthy of everything and so much more. So Lord, we ask that you help us just to be your faithful servants. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.